Welcome to our webinar, Zivacon SA+, Arcfall Protection in Low Voltage switch Switchboards. My name is Martin Sichting. I'm responsible for the Zivacon SA+, in the region Germany. The main topic of this webinar is the Arcfall Protection in our Zivacon SA+, including a consideration of the significance and origin of an Arcfall, a review with regard to the requirements of the standards as well as passive, preventive and active measures to avoid and limit an arc fault. And since we receive one question rather often, yes, the session is recorded and we make the recording and the info package available to all participants. If you already joined one of our webinars, you already know the Q&A field on the upper right side in this application. Please type in your question to us and we will be able to, uh, we will be available live for your questions at the end of the session. Together with me in the studio, I'm supported by my colleague Andreas. I would also like to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Andreas Stöcker and I'm responsible for the product management for Civicon S8 low voltage switchboard. Andreas. Low voltage switchboard is produced in accordance with IEC 61439-2. This regulates, for example, the topic of degree of protection, internal separation and the design verification, but also the subject of arcfall protection. The standard defines the requirements for the construction and behavior of the switchboard. However, the behavior in the event of an arc fault is explicitly not covered by this. The requirements for the behavior under condition of arcing are regulated in a technical report, which is not part of the IEC 61439-2. But before we go deeper here, we should perhaps first look at what an arc fault is and what can lead to this worst case scenario. According to the definition in the standard, an arc fault is a short circuit burning freely in air that can occur as a result of a fault between active parts of different potentials and or between active parts and other conductive parts within a switchgear assembly. This ionizes the air and makes it conductive, allowing the current to flow more or less unhindered in the resulting plasma. The pressure rises rapidly like an explosion, there's a bang. As a result, the temperature also rises sharply and can reach values of several thousand Kelvin. In addition, the high temperature also burn or vaporize the material surrounding the arc fault. The first thing that burns is the insulation materials of the cables. Next, the copper, and after some 200 milliseconds, the steel of the enclosure can also start to burn. The burning materials may also produce toxic fumes that should not be inhaled under any circumstances. All in all, this is a very dangerous event, which can ultimately lead to serious, possibly even fatal injuries to people and of course damage of electrical facilities. In this short video, you can clearly see the destruction that comes from such an event. That's very impressive. It is also important to know how such incidents can occur. First of all, arc faults are very rare. They represent an absolutely exceptional situation. In practice, however, we see a wide range of possibilities as the cause of arc faults. On the one hand, these can be, for example, external circumstances such as pollution, which means that the insulation properties in the switchboard are no longer guaranteed. This can be, for example, also by animals that can enter the system and cause a short circus. However, handling errors are also a possible source of risk. For example, incorrectly carried out maintenance work or non-compliance with the environmental conditions for which the system is designed. Like in this example, a system that stood in the building without windows and heating and is 
iced over. Last but not least, errors in planning also pose a further risk, for example, due to incorrect dimensioning of equipment or cables. In an extreme case, this can lead to an overload of the components, which can then lead to failure and also to short circuit. And this means an arc fault. And if this risk actually occurs, then the consequences are drastic, as I said in the beginning. The danger to life and limb is definitely the worst aspect. But of course, there are also economic consequences due to the destruction of the system and thus the outage of the power distribution. This means nothing other than a system shutdown and thus loss of production. The costs for this quickly go into the six-figure range and above. Considering that in the event of an outage, the repair work can take longer, days or even weeks. I don't want to go into the possible consequences of personal injury here. A technical report from the IEC standard series is helping us. IEC technical report 61641 describes the requirements for testing low voltage switchboards under the condition of arcing. Technical report means that it is not a standard. It's an informative document that reflects the state of the standardization and can be incorporated into a standardization work later. No measures are defined how to achieve arc fault protection. This is left to the manufacturer. However, it defines how the test is to be carried out and how the test result is to be evaluated. These include voltage, currents, and the burning time of the arc. But also features such as who has access to the assembly. Everyone, that means unrestricted access. Or only authorized personnel, this corresponds to restricted access. The proof of arc fault protection can be carried out in two different ways. On the one hand, by testing. In this case, there's an arc tested zone. And on the other, other hand, by taking appropriate measures that make the occurrence of an arc fault unlikely. Here, we are talking about an arc protected zone. This can be achieved, for example, by insulating conductors. In a switchboard, you will usually find a combination of both. Arc fault tested and arc fault protected zones. It is also important to define the protection goals in advance. Here, the minimum requirement would be personal protection. This means that a person standing in front of the system will not be harmed. In addition, system protection can also be achieved. And this is important for avoiding or reducing downtime. The effects of the arc fault are then limited to a defined part of the system. For example, a defined part can be a cubicle of the switchboard. This would then have to be replaced after the event. Or you can narrow down the area further to one compartment. In this case, only the compartment with the withdrawable unit would have to be replaced in a system in withdrawable design. After the test, it's time to evaluate the test results. When is the test passed? Perhaps first a few words about the test arrangement. There's a grid standing in front of the test specimen. Attached to this grid are small rectangles of fabric, so-called indicators. These indicators are intended to simulate the clothing of a person standing in short distance, approximately 30 centimeters, in front of the system. Two different fabric qualities can be used. A lightweight cotton fabric designed to replicate unrestricted access, like in leisure wear, or a heavy fabric of around 150 grams per square meter that represents the work clothes of staff with limited access. There are a total of seven criteria for passing the test. For this purpose, the test result is evaluated based on these criteria. The first five criteria are required for personal protection, the remaining two criteria for system or assembly protection. Criterion one means properly secure doors Covers do not open and remain in position in such a way that they provide a minimum degree of protection IP1X. Criterion 2 states that 
No parts of the switchgear assembly with a mass of more than 60 gram are thrown away. In order to meet criterion 3, up to a height of 2 meter, there are no holes as a result of burning of the arc fault on the outer enclosure parts that are designated as freely accessible. For criterion 4, the indicators don't ignite. And in the case of criterion 5, the protective conductor circuit for accessible parts of the enclosure is still effective in accordance with the IEC 61439-2 standard. If all this is fulfilled, then we have achieved personal protection. If the following criteria 6 and 7 are met, the protection for the assembly is proven. Criterion 6 means that the arc fault is confined to the defined area of the switchgear assembly where it originated and does not propagate into adjacent areas within the switchgear assembly. With criterion 7, emergency operation of the remaining switchgear assembly is possible after fault elimination or after disconnection or removal of the affected functional units in the defined area. In order to be able to describe the whole thing more easily, four so-called arcing classes are defined in the technical report. We start with the arcing class A. Here we achieve personal protection under arcing conditions by fulfilling criteria 1 to 5. Arcing class B corresponds to a switchgear assembly with personal and system protection under arc fault conditions that meet criteria 1 to 6. In other words, limit the impact to a certain area. In arcing class C, limited operation as described in criterion 7 is also possible. Last but not least, there is arcing class I. This is a switchgear assembly with a reduced risk of arc faults due to the sole use of arc protected zones, meaning insulation, for example. In practice, however, this form will occur rather rarely. A system that is completely protected by insulation is difficult and labor intensive to realize. In the next part of our webinar, we want to show you how we, as a switchboard manufacturer, can meet these requirements and help you plan and install a safe power distribution. The protection of your personal and equipment starts with the planning stage. With the Simara suite, you have good and integrated tools at your disposal. In addition to Samaris project as a planning tool, Samaris curves as a visualization of the time current characteristic curves and thus the trip characteristic curves we offer Samaris design. This allows you to simulate your grid setup and use the results to design your switchboard and protection devices to meet the requirements. These are general system design data for example, rated current of the main bus bar and the rated short term withstand current ICW, the switching capacity of the incoming circuit breaker or outgoing breaker ICU, or the expected short circuit current and the arcing time IP arc and T arc. However, the construction of the switchboard itself also supports the preventive measures. Passive measures here would include a uniform operating concept for all withdrawable unit sizes, various locking devices for main switching devices and mechanical locks that allow switching only when the withdrawable unit is correctly inserted and when the door is closed. Other measures are the insulation of the main bus bar and the customer connection, the right selection of internal separation, the use of shutters at the distribution bus bars or adapter plates or on the circuit breaker. These can prevent live parts from being accidentally touched with a tool during maintenance work. Further ones includes, for example, the use of coding. This avoids confusion between withdrawable units of different ratings and circuit breakers of different ratings. Reactive measures include, for example, the arc resistant hinge 
and locking system, as well as protective measures at the front ventilation openings, along with pressure relief flaps in roof plates. Furthermore, the use of the arc barrier, which prevents the arc from moving from one cubicle to the next, is a simple and efficient means of limiting an arc fault to one cubicle. But is that all enough? As always, it depends on what is to be achieved. However, the requirements of IC Technical Report 61641 can be met in any case. This still looks spectacular in the high-speed recording, but this is a past test with the classic upgrade measures. In the last section, we discussed how we can use passive and preventive measures to limit or even avoid an arc fault. However, when limiting the arc fault with the help of passive measures, an arc flash burning time of 300 milliseconds can be expected. This duration in an event such as an arc fault also means a very high energy conversion. Let's recall the graph on the thermal influence that we presented to you at the beginning of the webinar. We see that there is an increased risk of fire beginning in the range of temperature rise from approximately 100 milliseconds. Due to the exponential increase, the risk of damage is increasing with every millisecond. In the following, we would like to introduce you to a way to further reduce the tripping time and thus the energy released. In this case, we are talking about an active arc fault protection through an internal arc fault mitigation system, which is integrated according to IEC technical specification 63107. Such a system usually consists of a detection relay, light sensors, current transformers, a circuit breaker, and an optional quenching device. More on that in a moment. The light sensors are installed in different areas of the switchboard and monitor for the occurrence of light emission from an arc fault. If a light event is detected, a signal is sent to the detection relay. This sends a trip signal to the circuit breaker of the incoming feeder. It opens and the arc extinguishes. In order to avoid false triggering by other bright events, the sensors are precisely matched to the spectrum of an arc fault. And the sensors are also available with different light sensitivities, depending on where the sensor is to be installed. A further safeguard is the use of current transformers in the incoming feeder as an additional triggering criterion. Only if a steep rise in the current is detected in addition to the light signal, the trip signal is sent to the circuit breaker. All of this happens very fast, within about 15 milliseconds until the circuit breaker has switched off. This means that the impact on the system is significantly reduced. In order to ensure protection, even in the event of an arc fault occurring on the primary side, in which case the CTs would not measure a current flow, there is also a special pressure sensor that trips the upstream distribution in medium or low voltage. To be able to reduce the stress even further, I would like to remind you once again of the pressure curve. This system can also be combined with a quenching device. This reacts so quickly that you can get ahead of the peak of the pressure curve and can thus also reduce the mechanical load on the system. What does the quenching device do? Well, the device causes an all-pole short circuit on the main bus bar. This short circuit immediately removes the energy from the arc fault and the arc goes out. The resulting short circuit is now switched off by the circuit breaker. How does the quenching device work? The setup is quite simple. Inside the device is a cylindrical contact which is moved extremely fast when triggered by the magnetic field of a coil and thus creates a short circuit. How quickly does the system respond? The total triggering time from the ignition of the arc fault to its extinguishing 
is usually significantly less than 5 milliseconds. If we remember the pressure curve, we prevent the pressure wave from becoming so strong in the first place and causing any major damage. In this video, you can see a test with the quenching device activated. The impact on the switchboard is now significantly reduced. And since the quenching device is a purely electromechanical principle, there's another great advantage. After tripping and of course eliminating the cause of the malfunction, the system can be easily reset and is ready for use again within a few minutes. This means that no components need to be exchanged or replaced. A simple reset is all it takes to restore the system org for protection. In addition, a test function is possible with the system, which can be used up to 100 times. And since the quenching device is a purely electromechanical principle, there's another great advantage. After tripping and, of course, eliminating the cause of the mail function, the system can be easily reset and is ready for use again within a few minutes. This means that no components need to be exchanged or replaced. A simple reset is all it takes to restore the system's arc for protection. In addition, a test function is possible with the system, which can be used up to 100 times. And as the system can be used up to 690 volts, 100 kA, it can be installed in the majority of applications. This ensures comprehensive protection of the system, the system-related processes, and the personal. The three essential components of an arc fault, light, current rise, and pressure, are detected and evaluated. A shutdown takes place quickly and safely. Let's summarize. An arc fault is the worst possible event that can occur in a switchboard, although it is extremely rare. In the case of an arc fault, large amounts of energy are converted within a very short time in the form of an increase in temperature and an explosive increase in pressure. IEC 61439-2 defines the basic specifications with regard to the requirements for switchgear design verifications but not for arc fault protection. IEC Technical Report 61641 defines arc protected and arc tested zones. The technical specification 63107 describes the integration of active arc fault protection systems. A distinction is made between arcing class A, personal protection, class B, personal protection and assembly protection, and class C, personal protection and specific assembly protection, including emergency operation after an incident. An arc fault is an invitably accompanied by an outage of the system as well as downstream processes. The resulting downtime costs can quickly reach a financially sensitive area leading to further additional costs. Therefore, it is important to avoid arc faults and their consequential costs or to minimize them as much as possible. In order to limit or even avoid the arc fault, preventive, passive and active options are offered. At the same time, active arc fault protection currently offers the best possible protection for people and systems. With the help of sensors, the three decisive properties of an arc fault, light, current increase and pressure are detected. With the help of an internal arc fault control device, IACD, the upstream circuit breaker can be switched off after the sensors have tripped. The shutdown time is reduced to less than 50 milliseconds. If the quenching device is also used, the arc fault can be cleared in less than 5 milliseconds by a short circuit of the main bus bar. This further reduces the stress on the system and further minimizes the impact.
If you want to read more information on this topic, we recommend our white paper, ArcFault Prevention and Protection, which is also offered in the information package for this event. We believe that our webinar has given you a better understanding of the topic of ArcFault Protection. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. If you have the opportunity, you can also visit us live at the Hanover Fair this year. In Hall 9, you are welcome to ask your questions directly. The fair will take place from April 22nd to April 26th in Hanover, Germany at the Exhibition Grounds. We would like to use the remaining time for a Q&A session. So please feel free and use the chat function to ask your questions. Hello. Um, you may have noticed uh, that we've changed location for the Q&A session and you also may have noticed that my colleague Martin went missing um, as he's actually ill today. So all the best uh, from here. Uh, and we had to pre-record uh, the webinar. But now for the, for the questions, I'm live here uh, in our showroom in front of a, a Civicon S8 switchboard. Um, yeah, I'll start uh, with the first question. Um, can the arc fault be localized with the help of the arc fault, uh, with help of the uh, active arc fault protection? And I actually would like to answer the question with the help of the uh, demo board that I have uh, right behind me, uh, because we have installed uh, the yeah, arc fault protection, uh, arc fault detection system here as well. And to do that, uh, I have to simulate uh, that the current is flowing uh, to yeah to be registered from the uh, from the relay, and I have to uh, simulate light. Uh, this is the uh, protection uh, device itself, the AQD, and here we have a sensor, and uh, to yeah to demonstrate that, I have to put light uh, in front of that sensor gets a tripping. Uh, you should have uh, heard uh, a light sound that was the uh, tripping of the device. And on the relay, uh, I can see which sensor uh, tripped the device. So in this case, it was sensor uh, three, and I know sensor three is installed here, so I can locate the origin of the fault. And yeah, the device is tripped. I can clear the fault, and now I can which is the, the unique thing about that um, system is I can reset the system quite, uh, quite easily um, mechanically uh, with, that, uh, with that lever. And yeah, after a, couple of, uh, after a couple of minutes, the system would be up and running again. Um, next question, is the HUD always required or can the IACD also be used on its own? Um, yes, the IACD, so the relay could be used as a standalone device uh, too, together with the sensors and together with the ACB. So in that case, uh, the relay would just send a tripping signal to the ACB and the fault would be cleared um, on, on that way without uh, the quenching device. Next question. Um, is it possible that several AQDs are required? Um, yes, this is true. Uh, in that case, we have a single bus bar system with just one incomer. Uh, and here, one quenching device is enough. But if I have a setup with several incomers uh, that are uh, connected to several bus bar sections um, that are interconnected with uh, bus couplers, uh, then I would need one AQD or one detection system for each bus bar section. Next question. What happens uh, if the second, uh, what happens after the second arc fault tripping? Well, after the second arc fault uh, tripping, the device uh, needs to be exchanged as it is only uh, usable for two times. Um, but uh, if two arc fault events happen in the same uh, installation, uh, then there are also other things that 
uh, may have gone, uh, gone wrong in the past. Um, but after two times, the device uh, needs to be exchanged. Next question. Um, what about retrofit or brownfield installations? So that is, yeah, rather difficult um, as uh, the sensors are installed in locations which may not be uh, easily accessible and the placement of the sensors needs to be very uh, precisely done. Uh, so there is no general yes or no. Um, theoretically, it is possible to do a retrofit of that system, uh, but this comes uh, uh, that this needs a, a deep evaluation of the of the uh, actual installation or situation. Next question: um, In Simaris project, you can only set the arc. Uh, fault class A or C for the S8. Uh, the webinar also talks about B. Why is arc fault class B not uh, configured in Simaris project? Well, we shortly mentioned it in the, in, in the webinar. Um, we only cover classes A, personal protection, and C, which is system protection that also allows an um, uh, emergency operation after the fault has been cleared. Uh, so we skipped class B, which does not include the uh, emergency operation. So if you look for class uh, B, you would be supplied with a class C with the extra of the uh, availabil availability of uh, the emergency operation. What happens uh, in the event of a fault upstream of the main circuit breaker uh, or the, the, the main uh, switch, the incomer. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, if, if the fault is happening uh, before the CTs uh, that are installed. So you would actually not measure a current um, on, the, uh, on the incoming side if the, breaker is, uh, if the breaker is switched off, or you would uh, break the current flowing uh, with the breaker um, but uh, the arc uh, would still be uh, supplied from the, from the upstream breaker. So therefore, uh, a special type of sensor is available um, that is not just looking for a light emission, but that is also looking for, uh, that is rather looking for uh, pressure. Uh, we've seen from the, uh, from the curves that we showed, uh, the pressure is also um, significantly rising and is also doing that very fast. Uh, so in case of the incoming uh, side, uh, we would use a pressure sensitive sensor uh, that is then um, creating, uh, sending the trip signal uh, to the uh, HUD, the short circuiting device, and also to the upstream breaker uh, so that the fault can be also, will also be cleared from, from that side. Next question, how often can the system uh, switch off an arc fault. Well, uh, we've mentioned that two times. After two times, um, the system uh, needs to be uh, replaced, or the, the, the quenching device uh, needs to be replaced. Um, what effect does the uh, does contamination uh, on the pressure uh, or uh, light sensors have on the effectiveness of the system. So the system needs to be installed very carefully, um, very precisely, and we've done it in the way so that these sensors are protected uh, from dusting, from uh, pollution over uh, the uh, lifetime of the switchboard so that they will not lose any effectiveness uh, while, the, while the installation is running. Um, next question, can the parameters of the HUD or the IECD be adjusted over the operating time of the switchboard, e.g. Uh, when a system expansion uh, takes place? Um, generally, the, the system is preset uh, when it is uh, delivered, uh, but yes, um, there is a possibility of changing uh, parameters to adjust uh, parameters uh, yeah, in case 
uh, that your uh, system configuration uh, is changed so that yeah that you extend uh, the system with additional sections then you would need uh, additional sensors for instance or you you would even change the layout significantly with a with a second incomer uh, then these adjustments can also be made uh, to the to the system um, next question um, protective uh, core transformers or normal transformers well uh, for detecting uh, the uh, yeah, the, the current rise uh, in the uh, in the installation um, normal uh, CTs are uh, sufficient. Uh, they are uh, yeah certified for the system, or they are tested with the system, so that um, yeah normal uh, CTs are enough uh, to uh, detect the uh, rise. I don't know if this is visible here. Um, we uh, uh, use normal CTs uh, in, in that case. Um, is there a let through characteristic available for the active arc for protection? Um, no, uh, the arc for protection uh, system is not a current limiting device, uh, so there is no let through. Uh, characteristic available um, in case the uh, arc quenching device operates, the full load current uh, will be yeah, uh, put on the system or will be loaded on the system. So if you have an installation uh, with a 85 uh, kA transformer, then the full 85 kA will be uh, on the system until the main breaker uh, switches uh, switches the uh, the incomer off, um, but the system is always designed to carry this full load uh, current for yeah the for the given time of the uh, of the arc fault uh, the, the arc fault time. Um, thus, the ATUD um, also ground the bus bars. Um, no, it's not a grounding device. Uh, it creates a three-pole short circuit between uh, between uh, the faces, between the active uh, faces on the main bus bar. Um, no grounding device, but um, yeah, the, the energy is, is loaded uh, to the system. And I just skipped one question, which I've <laughs> just briefly seen, uh, which I would like to answer. Um, is such a solution also available for uh, medium voltage was the question. Yes, the system, um, a similar system is also available for medium voltage, it's called Sequench. Um, I think we can uh, provide uh, a link to, uh, to that, um, to more information on that uh, also, also afterwards if it's of interest. Would the installation of inert gas uh, CO2 flooding system be uh, surfacing TR61641. Um, no, the answer is a definite no. Um, such a system would be too slow. Um, inert gas or CO2 flooding uh, is for uh, firefighting or prevention of fire. And here we are with the arc fault, we are a step uh, before the fire. Um, so a, a system like this would simply be too, too slow. Uh, to be to be efficient, um, it would uh, probably stop the consequences of uh, of burning uh, of a fire that uh, results from the arc fault, uh, but the destruction uh, from from the arc fault ex uh, event itself could not be avoided uh, with such a with a, such a system. In case of fixed panels, how is the arc fault uh, protected zone module replaced? Well. In case of a fixed installation, um, the work uh, there is much more work to do um, than either the complete uh, section. Uh, yeah, then yeah. In that case, the complete section uh, would need to be replaced. Or if it is a compartmentalized uh, 
solution for uh, fixed installation than also that compartment containing uh, the affected components uh, would need to be uh, replaced. Next question, uh, do you put on instruments uh, on door, ammeters, relays, etc., in test? Yes, uh, we do that uh, during our um, ArcFall tests. Uh, we've placed um, various type of different uh, instruments, uh, also uh, larger instrument protection devices on the door to test uh, that they stay securely mounted and are not uh, blown uh, uh, from, the, from the front or from their, uh, from their location in the, in the door and would cause, uh, would cause any damage. Um, does the IEC ask for ARC protection as mandatory means for LV switchboard, or is it up to the customer needs? Um, yes, actually, this is the case. Uh, it is a optional um, agreement or arrangement between the customer and the supplier. Up until now, ARC fault protection is not part of the IEC 61439. Uh, might change in the future, but uh, today it's not part of it. Uh, and so this is a separate, or this requires a separate agreement between um, the customer and the supplier. Uh, in many markets, at least the personal protection is a requirement in terms of uh, EHS. Uh, so um, the customer usually asks for that. Um, I believe coding will not protect, prevent arcing fault. Um, yes, the coding itself of a unit um, will not uh, protect in case of an arc fault, uh, but it will prevent, it is a measure to reduce the possibility uh, of a maloperation. So for instance, if you have uh, withdrawable units of the same size, and but they have a different rating, uh, then you could theoretically swap their positions or mix them up accidentally. And then you would place components uh, in a compartment uh, providing not the required protection for the cable that is connected, for instance. Uh, and therefore coding is an effective measure uh, to prevent uh, dangerous situations that eventually could need could lead uh, to an uh, to an arc fault. Uh, do you have arc barrier used in cable alley? Um, no, on the uh, cable alleys uh, there are uh, no arc barriers in our installation. Um, either. Uh, you have the, um, the light sensor installed in the cable compartment protecting that in case of the active arc fault protection. Uh, or um, as you are on the, on the secondary side, if you are uh, in an outgoing section, um, then the protection uh, will also be provided by the protective device uh, of the feeder uh, for, the, uh, for the cable alley. Um, is there a curve including aluminum uh, conductors as well, since some countries adopt this in LV switch gear? Um, I'm afraid I cannot help with that. <laughs> I only have the information on, uh, on copper as, uh, yeah, our switchboards are uh, only, only available uh, with um, copper uh, bus bars as, as conductors. And I think I take one uh, last, or yeah, two last questions I see. Um, according to Saudi Aramco standards, bus bar inside LV switchboard must be insulated by insulation tape. Are you implementing this kind of bus bar insulation? Yes, of course, this is a, uh, an optional uh, measure. Um, sometimes 
um, it is provided as a result uh, of, the, of the testing. Uh, but as an option, uh, main bus bar insulation, for instance, is available, but also um, inside feeders um, uh, insulating the, the live parts uh, if bus bars are, uh, are used here uh, is, is possible. Um, is arc flash relay effective when feeder is off, um, e.g. arc flash at bus bar incoming side? I think um, we had a similar question already. Um, if the feeder is off um, and I have a sensor placed on the incoming side, um, then it needs to be a pressure sensitive sensor. And then the relay will send a trip signal to the upstream breaker, to so the medium voltage breaker, for instance, and uh, will yeah will trip that breaker uh, to yeah uh, to protect the to protect the system and to uh, switch off the, uh, the, the the power supply. Um, yeah, I see that there are still some uh, some questions coming in. Um, I will close the, F F the live uh, Q&A session uh, here now, uh, but uh, we will come back to you and all the remaining questions uh, that have not been answered yet um, or that you are uh, still asking um, will be answered um, in the next days uh, after, uh, after the webinar. Um, don't forget to download the uh, information uh, that is available with the uh, with the event. Um, the download button should be in the uh, upper right uh, corner where we supply the, the information package. Yeah, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you again for your attention uh, to this webinar. Um, I hope uh, it was interesting and informative uh, to you. Uh, please, uh, yeah, you also use the possibility uh, and join other webinars uh, that we are offering. And yeah, thank you and have a good day.